This is Trevor Sternad from the Black Dahlia Murder here, and you're listening to the Ever Black Podcast. Hey, human scum, this is odorous from Guam. We're going to the Fear Factory. This is George Corps, Commander Fisher. This is Jasmine Devil Drop. This is Wade from Our Lost Enemy. The Magnificent Cool Style of Tennessee. He is at Wednesday 13. This is Bruce Anderson. Rex from Club Devil Hill. This is Gary Green from Simple Tour, and you're listening to Ever Black Podcast. Before we go into this episode of the Ever Black Podcast, we just need to give a shout out to our show supporters, the Occult Clothing Brand Electric, which love amazing apparel from shirts to hoodies to hats to beanies, dresses and more. Check out their full range at electricwitch.com.au and put in the code EVERBLACK for 20% off your order. Also, don't forget to subscribe, rate and review the Ever Black Podcast on Spotify and iTunes podcast streams and see all our video interviews on the Ever Black YouTube channel. You can also also read all our articles and reviews at everblack.com.au. All right, on with the show. Uh, mate, how's uh, everything going over there in uh, Finland? Yeah, Help. no complaints. I should say. Uh, we're all kind of busy with the release and we're all fairly sick of lockdowns, but, you know, it's what's to be expected at this point and um, hopefully uh, the situation is likely to change soon and we can start talking about shows coming back. But I've given up trying to predict when it's going to be, so... Let's see what the powers that be say, and uh, we'll get back out there when we can. <laughs> oh, mate, I know. It's 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 full on everywhere right now, and I'm really hoping it, it does for, for you guys, especially uh, you, you're about to release your new album, Resident Human, on March 26. And you know what, man? Despite all the craziness, it just seems like right now is such a good time for you guys. Like, there's such a huge buzz about your band i mean the albums it's phenomenal it's fantastic um so i mean do you feel like it's you're coming into like a bit of a new era for the band yeah i think so i mean um the, the main reason is i feel like we've finally got our dream team we've had so many lineup changes for, for lots of really convoluted reasons but uh between moving backwards and this we've had uh, uh let me work this out i think we've had three member changes uh, and we've got um, not all those people are playing on the records, so it's it's been tricky. Um, mm. But I think that alone is helping a lot. We've been rehearsing a lot because we haven't been able to tour live, and um, just in the rehearsal room, it's sounding better than it ever has. I think with the new material as well, I think we, we've really embraced kind of a more organic sounding, um, vibing album. So, and I think that comes off the back of we, we just toured a lot. Like before moving backwards, we'd maybe played 20 shows ever. And um, since this album, we've done maybe well, well over 100 in 2019. And I, I think we just got used to how that sounds and kind of the, um, the the natural groove between the instruments. And we tried to capture more of that on this record, which I think is a much better fit for us than this super clean production style that we used previously. Yeah, it's it, it's uh, it seems a little bit more uh, aggressive, a less, less aggressive, well, yeah. less aggressive, I should say. Um, than than moving ba- moving backwards, you know, what what was it sort of that drove that 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 direction? Well, for moving backwards, we we had a lot of density where the harmonic range was quite similar. So, for example, in the middle of up the chain, there's there's lots of a low C going on, and uh, we thought this is going to get completely buried unless we have a very very clean mix. Um, mm. So it was, and uh, then we had vultures, and we thought this one we just wanted to hit extremely hard all the way through. Um, so for the material, it kind of felt like a natural choice to have something very clean and very heavy for the bulk of the sound. Uh, by comparison with this material, um, th- we really thought about the arrangements from the ground up that we wanted it to feel more dynamic and more like a live performance. And uh, for example, when we were tracking Hyperion, we switched for click off completely which was absolutely terrifying and we had no idea what to expect. But the, um, I think just letting that life, the natural um, kind of performance, which, which people have when they play instruments, letting that speak on the album. Uh, because, I mean, as you well know, we live in a time where you can manipulate everything from, yeah. uh, to rhythm. And, and, and some music does that to, to great effects with incredible control. Like bands like Infected Mushroom, for example, it's insane what they can do with sound design. And it's really inspiring to hear it. But, uh, I think we want to be somewhere in the middle. Um, it's a pretty big spectrum, you know, infected mushroom all the way back through to Led Zeppelin. But I think we, we definitely fall on the more vintage style with the playing, where we want the tempo to breathe and we want the some of the mistakes to be left into the playing because that's what makes it feel like a person and not like a computer. I like that too. 
I love it when I hear an album and it, something jumps out and it sounds like it's a a mistake they've gone. You know what? Just leave it. I love that honesty. You know. So, yeah, me too. And um, there are lots of good ways to approach this. I'm, I'm really not trying to pass any judgment. It just felt like the right fit for these songs was to really show that vulnerability and that humanity. And uh, yeah. by the time we were recording drums and bass, we had no lyrics whatsoever, plans, no vocal lines, nothing, just instrumentals that seemed to work very well. Um, so it was really from capturing those performances, realising this does sound a lot more personal and vulnerable and flawed than, than moving backwards in, in, in a good way, we hoped. Um, and that actually led us to find some of the lyrical topics that fit that too down the line. Was it was it hard getting everyone together to jam and record and and do all those things, you know, during the shit show that was 2020, you know? The short answer is yes. It, it was a fucking nightmare. Uh, we our, our guitarist in the band at the oh, time, man. who's no longer with us. Um, he couldn't even come to the studio because he was living in a different province since uh, we had a lockdown in the Helsinki area where we were living. So um, there were just three of us in the studio and we, we only tracked drums and bass while we were there. The guitars, I tracked all of that in my home studio into with the iBox. Um, we, we played a few bits in the studio but needed kind of live amp interaction. But for a lot of just riff stuff, for, the, for those in layman's terms, it means I play a guitar at home into my computer we take those files to a studio, send it back out into an amplifier and record that sound with a microphone. That's called reamping. Yeah, and that re-amping. means that we could do it with um, exposing less people so it seemed like the right move. And, and even with the vocals, you know, I tracked everything myself. I was editing it while I did it in a, a very nice studio not too far from where I live. So, so the rig I was recording into was, was amazing, but it was very strange being my own editor and having to pick my own takes because uh, it's a... Uh, <laughs> It's not great for their self-esteem, but I think um, it was also quite cathartic. I think by the end of it, uh, I think I learned to kind of view my voice in a different way because I think um, it's like when you hear yourself on a recording for the first time, just speaking, and you think, "Oh my God, that's what I sound like." It, it's <laughs> that magnified by like fifty. Just knowing the takes to pick and uh, knowing what to to keep that's a bit jaunty and what to what to throw away. You know, as someone who did do some vocal tracking during the whole thing, and I had to go in by myself because no one else could come, same situation, I found it incredibly difficult as well. Like, and you, anytime you, you're your own worst critic anyway, I don't know. I don't know any yeah. vocals to go, can go in there and just be like, yeah, I'm just going to go and smash it out, you know, because you start hearing your own voices and start, oh, should I do it this way? Should I do it this way? I guess it's just the way we are, <laughs> but um, but uh, you know, it, it, the end result is phenomenal. I think what you've done on this album is is absolutely incredible, you know. And I, I guess it took a lot of trust in yourself. And I, do you feel better after that for yourself? You know what I mean? Like your confidence. Kind of, yeah. I mean, if there's anything I've learned over the past few years with just doing the music for Wheel is that creativity in its purest form is the freedom to fail. And I think we fail around 95% of the time and the 5% we don't goes on the records. And it's uh, it sounds really blunt and brutal, but I think that's just exactly what it is, I think. But we have kind of an unhealthy relationship with um, kind of how things are produced, I think, these days because of how we portray it on social media where you've got to kind of sell the constant win and yeah, of course, it was always going to be this way. Try and almost send it like some some God-given fever dream, like uh, what goes into inspiration. But the truth is, sometimes that happens. Like uh, for the last track, Resident Human, uh, the whole arrangement I came up with in just three really good days where I just kept on having good ideas. And uh, one after the other, just bam, 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 and these all fit together. But all the rest of them, it wasn't like that at all. It was a grind. You know, it was okay. There's something about this first idea I like, but the minutes two to four are just crap. I'm going to delete that. I'll put something else in. What if I switch those ideas around and just constantly shuffling and just tweaking the puzzle until the it was as good as possible? And uh, I think especially working within the band where most of the original ideas, um, like the, the key concepts and the first structure versions I'm doing myself, but after that it becomes extremely democratic and we're all just picking at it, putting it to pieces um, and it's only ever done when we run out of things to pick at. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of bands, probably. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, don't get me wrong, like, I can be objective at this point because I'm a bit more separated from it. We got the Masters back in October, so I've had some time to process it. 
But at the time, um, I couldn't listen to it for about two months without thinking, yeah, should I put this extra harmony in here? And this section, is that too long? Uh, it, it really takes a while to get comfortable with that. How do you, ha, where, where's the point where you literally have to turn to yourself and go, that'll do, it's done? Because I know it's a never-ending <laughs> battle, as you were saying. Oh, I could change it. You just got to put your foot down with yourself, don't you? What, what was that point? I think that this is what's great about working with people you trust. Uh, luckily in Wheel, I mean, uh, I'm an untrained Joe from Finland, uh, sorry, from the UK who's moved to Finland. And here, everyone is uh, just in- insanely well-trained and they've all been educated to a very high level because of the free education system here. So, um, you know, Santari and Bucky particularly, they're, they're very, very talented, decorated musicians. So is our new guitarist, you'll see. But, you know, I was playing in pubs, you know, back in the UK, playing covers to, to make my living. And uh, my guitar lessons, apart from a few very short lessons when I was a teenager professionally, my dad taught me how to play just some really basic stuff. So I guess I've just learned to trust their opinions because um, if I think it's basically there and they think it's basically there, we're probably right. And um, we just try and aim for we're writing for ourselves. If we would buy it, then we'll make it. Um, And if we wouldn't, then we're not going to release it. And uh, uh, it's really hard to tell, isn't it? Because uh, we don't know the minds of every other musician in the market. But yeah. I think there is definitely a, a spectrum of sincerity with music that's put out there. And uh, at least what we do, we, we've got no oversight at all. We've got completely free hands of what we make. And um, for all intents and purposes, we're still completely independent. Um, and I think for that reason, uh, if nothing else, it's a really sincere album. And I'm really happy with that. 100%. And I think it's everything I'm seeing so far is it's starting to come back and it's all that po- you've put it out there into the world and the, it's the positivity starting to trickle back. As soon as it drops, mate, it's just I think it's going to be an overwhelming feeling of, of just it's just going to be awesome for you, mate. I'm so stoked for you. You've worked your ass off and it's going to pay off. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it at this point. It's so strange putting the singles out in this order as well, because Fugue, we never thought that was going to be a single. That song we, we wrote just before the uh, studio time. In fact, I finished it two days before we started recording drums. And uh, understandably, somebody and Aki were so stressed out, they were just going, look, just, if we've got time, we'll try it, but forget it. We're working on the other songs, which were finished and we knew were going to be good. And it, it was kind of an afterthought. And it, even things like the drums in that song, I, yeah. I program a lot of stuff on a keyboard, then I send it to somebody and we start a discussion about what to do with the beats. Sometimes he keeps my ideas. Other times he goes, no, that's shit, I'm going to do this. Um, but the, with Fugue, it was, uh, it's been a really happy accident. And seeing how people react to it, I'm really pleasantly surprised because what we kind of thought that was the natural sequel to Skeletons from Moving Backwards, this kind of uh, uh, instrumental interlude thing. And uh, even the vocals were very kind of late additions to that track. But um, I like it. I think it's turned out really well. And it's, I think it's a break between uh, yeah. some other very stuff on the record, which was kind of the whole purpose. Oh, mate. Dig it. And, and was it your wife that did the, the artwork? Yes. Yes, it was. I keep inter- – every time you go to have a drink, I keep interrupting and asking I'm going to have one quick second. Yeah, mate. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> You're fine, don't worry. Good morning. There we go. <laughs> How you going? Yeah, uh, yeah. Your your wife did the artwork. Is that right? Yes, she did. She's actually done all of our artwork so far. Um, she's just an insanely good artist. Um, she's done all kinds of graphic design, painting, drawing. She's a uh, very capable of digital art as well. And this time around, she just smashed it out of the park. I mean, it, it, we thought that it, it's not a concept album, and um, the, you would not believe the number of times I've had to say it's not a concept album in the last month, but it's definitely, definitely not a concept album. That the are subjects you sure? are. Uh, I'm fairly sure, but thanks for asking. <laughs> 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 what we were thinking, so so lyrically, it's kind of like a figurative deconstruction of humanity, both in the, the inward-looking sense and uh, more of a social commentary sense, uh, or, or individual and collective as well. And uh, we thought the album cover could be a literal deconstruction of humanity. So it's a person's head coming to pieces um, and it shows what's inside. And and in terms of style, it's got an element of kind of Victorian era medical textbooks, which are way more gruesome if you think those cartoons were drawn from life most of the time. And uh, something about a museum as well, the way insects are displayed. 
um, we thought just laying all the pieces out in a really clinical, cold, dehumanising way would be uh, quite a cool counterpoint to be the lyrical subjects. Do you, do you sit down with your wife and, and discuss what you're sort of thinking, a direction, or do, did you just say, here's some of the tracks, go to town? Like, how's that work? <laughs> It was kind of both, right? We, we've always spoken about the lyrical topics because, um, you know, while I'm writing this stuff, we're talking every day. So, um, yeah, you know, she's normally quite abreast of what we're doing. But uh, I think this time around, um, we just kind of developed the idea together and um, she smashed it out of the park in the first go. I mean, um, the moving backwards cover took her months of coming up with uh, ideas and concepts and tweaking the, the layout and the, uh, the design of the composition. This time around, I think she spent about two and a half days and went, there you go. And everyone in the band said, yep, yeah, that's absolutely perfect. We'll use that. Oh, mate, it's awesome. And, uh, of course, I mean, I, I like the, that the band seems to draw influences from, you know, Opeth, Tool, Porcupine Tree, you know, Catatonia, um, and even our own Carnival. I hear a bit of Carnival in there too. Love that band, yeah. Mate, like it's a whole, you know, mix of, of those influences, you know, um, do you which one do you, would you say that you know you draw from the most it's really hard to say i mean i think the one i learned the most from was definitely tool just because of when i heard them i was yep. 16 and i'd never heard of the bands and uh, at this point i already owned the les paul so i think um, we were already kind of in the same ballpark but uh, i was recording an ep with this um this uh the very first band i ever played in um, back when I was 16. So it was me, this other guy from my school, and a, a drummer in the year below us. Um, and after we'd recorded, the uh, the producer said, James, come and sit with me. I want to show you something. And uh, he gave me a director's commentary of Anima. And he was just talking about structure and arrangement only, just how the pieces fit together and why they were chosen. And I was just blown away at um, the legs you could give um, these really basic instrumental parts that have been done to death over and over again. And um, it just kind of showed me that there's so much grounds to cover within these instruments. You know, anyone saying is guitar dead? No, but I think a lot of the forms it's used in are. Um, yeah. for, for example, I, I love metal music, but I think metal is in dire need of innovation. I think 90% of it sounds exactly the same. I think the song structures are the same. I think the, uh, the tropes are identical. And th there's nothing wrong with um, doing something traditional really, really well, because lots of bands do that, and I find that super interesting. For example, Billy Talent, um, who I love, they uh, they write these very contemporary songs, but I think there are these layers within layers with the vocal harmonies and the guitar arrangements specifically, the, the perfectly composed drums would do exactly what the song demands. Um, but I think Tool, they always find something really abstract to explore. They're the other end of the spectrum. Um, and I think Fear Inoculum just cinched the deal for me where after 13 years of people knowing what 10,000 days is and uh, no one making anything really quite like it, uh, especially things like the riff in Numa. Why has no one yeah. done that before? Or, or that drum beat <laughs> in Invincible where it's, it's three over seven in this certain way. It's such an obvious beat, but no one's done it. So they're not being contrite or complex for complexity's sake. But um, they're finding new ground to cover just because they're bothering to explore. And um, you know, we've taken a lot of those lessons to heart. I mean, especially we don't want to be complex for complexity's sake ever. Um, if it fits the song, then totally. But normally the simple thing is the right thing. Uh, I think also in terms of these big journeys, rather than having, you know, complete Nirvana dynamics. Nirvana are awesome, by the way. This is not me bashing them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where where it's, it's a one or a zero. There are all these um, intermediate levels of intensity um, through the dynamics of the song itself. And uh, that's definitely something which we use in Wheel. Like in Hyperion, I think there's, there, there's only one point in the song where it gets up to the absolute highest level and the rest of it is somewhere between zero and one. Uh, and I think just messing around with that dynamic and that journey is what makes it satisfying and hopefully what makes it feel like you haven't spent 12 minutes listening to a song. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, that last album, that last two album, it was it was incredible. I loved it. You know, it, should, it, it, it sort of ruffled a few feathers, but uh, you know, I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Um, but are you guys met on a TV show? Is that right? How did that happen? 
it, it's a really weird story. So I moved to Finland originally to, to play with um, a guy I studied with who was Finnish. Um, I was living in the UK in a town called Scarborough in the northeast, which yeah. is a small seaside town. Um, he moved back to Finland and won the Idols competition here. Um, wow. And then he just kept on inviting me over here to play. And at the time, I was kind of at a musical dead end in the UK. I was pretty much at a point where it was either quit musical together and move back to London and get a real job or t- take a punt and move to Finland and, and play pop music. And uh, it's never really been my stylistic dream to do that. But it, I think I was so desperate to play in some capacity. I thought, hey, I'll take it. Let's give it a go. So I was doing that for three or four years and um, it just wasn't making me very happy. So I decided to quit and do something else. I briefly had a job as a, a software salesman, which is another story. But um, one of the last shows I played with this idols guy was on a TV show in Finland called Tartu Mikki, which roughly translates to grab the mic. And the, the, the concept is people in public walk into a karaoke booth and start singing a popular song. If you know it, back in the studio, we push a buzzer. Uh, the band starts playing and we sing a bit of the song. So it's just a basic game show format with music involved. Um, but the guitarist in the house bands, who was really fucking unbelievable, uh, I just caught his eye a few times during the solos and uh, he got a w- winked back and started doing even more silly stuff on the guitar. We just got chatting after the show and um, we, we shared a lot of musical interests and um, we ended up founding Wheel together. I, I'd written some demos which were from a band I'd had back at university um and we formed the bands and recorded those and that was our first ep so um yeah just i kind of thought i was completely ready to stop and do something else and out of nowhere found an opportunity to do the band i've wanted to do since i was 16. that's weird how it goes (laughs) (laughs) how's that mate pretty lucky (laughs) it's funny how life uh, i can throw things like that at you eh? like sometimes you just go ah well and then then as soon as you think Bam, something happens. <laughs> and here we are, mate, talking to some yeah. dude in Australia. <laughs> exactly right. And, uh, you know, and what a great place to be. <laughs> Have you but been? Just on Carnival, uh, I've got to say something nice about Carnival because I'm talking to someone in Australia. That band's absolutely blew my mind. When I first heard Sound Awake, um, yeah. I still think that's one that I always uh, forget prog. It's one of the best albums ever in any genre. The production is sensational. I think Forrester Savile's a genius. Uh, the arrangements, the vocals, everything about that record, just wow. I'm a really, really big fan, and um, we're, we're hoping that one day we'll get to, to play with them. So if, if you're listening, Carnival, we love you. <laughs> hey, hey, I think that's an idea, mate. Just saying. <laughs> oh, just throwing it out there, that would be a fucking cool tour. Carnival, I think so. real, down here in Australia, beers and barbecues. Or the whole, have you been down here at all? No, it's still not. Although we'd love to come, but we haven't been there yet. I mean, do you know what? The, I think the greatest point of our whole career so far was that Carnival actually bought some merch from our first album and sent a message just saying that uh, it's something very tasteful and tactful along the lines of, hey, nice music, something like that. But that was the day we just thought, yeah, this is it. Good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, I could see that happening. That'd be really, really cool. Really cool. Sorry. Sorry, mate. Oh, so there's a bit of a lag. You go for it, mate. I know. It's weird, huh? That's what happens when we're on the, uh, as I say, the arse end of the world down here. You know, (laughs) right down the bottom. Yep. (laughs) Well, I definitely, uh, I hope we can see you guys down here and and so you can get touring and and everything soon because this album is phenomenal and and people are going to love it and want to experience those tracks live. So in saying that, have you got things sort of planned a little bit for for touring a little bit in the near future? Yeah, I mean, we've got a great management company who are already quite aggressively trying to get us out there for next year. We have a few tentative festival offers for this summer, but we have no real idea if they're going to happen or not. Um, I imagine some will, some won't. And uh, then for the autumn, but we've got nothing announced yet, but um, even in terms of plans, there's nothing very dramatic. There's not going to be a big surprise, I'm afraid. Uh, and then uh, beginning of 2022, we've got a tour with Apocalypse and Epica, which will be a, a full European tour, which I think runs from February to end of March, something like that. Um, other than that, we're, we're already talking about some other pretty cool stuff for next year. 
But it's just anyone's guess. I just I so, so hope that the vaccine is finally going to be the thing that turns the tide on this for live music, because um, if this goes on for too much longer, it's uh, not to be super negative because of, I'm not. I think there's going to be a music industry afterwards, but you can't help but wonder how, how aggressively this is going to affect everything and the future of it in general. <laughs> That's it. Oh, climbing up the walls, mate. We just want to get everyone just wants to you know, <laughs> tour and play and, and you know. Because as you know, it's it's where the heart is, you know. That, Completely, that, and, and yeah. we we feel exactly the same. Just that it's not, I miss playing, of course, but even just going to see a show, I'd love to yeah. go and watch it. Would be absolutely wonderful right now. <laughs> mate, that's it. Well, I definitely hope uh, we can see you guys very soon. It's been awesome hanging with you, mate. And uh, Resident Human is out on March 26. All the links will be down here, as I always say. Buddy, take care of yourself, you and your guys, and and your wife over there, and. Uh, yeah, fingers crossed, mate. I'll, I'll keep Thank the cold. Thank you so much. For you. Oh, you're a gentleman. Take care and uh, have a wonderful evening. And, um, yeah, thanks for your time. Keep it real. <laughs> thanks, buddy. Take care, man. Bye, mate.